So everybody, it's an immense honor, incredible pleasure to have Professor Emily Ching from the Chinese University of Hong Kong with us for the grand finale today. Um, Emily, please tell us about living a rich many histories. Well, thank you, Sri, for the kind invitation. I'm very glad to be able to contribute to this uh, Living Histories series. I actually enjoy a lot uh, watching many of the talks. I am a, a professor at the Department of Physics of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So let me tell you how I got to where I am. So this is Hong Kong. Hong Kong is located in uh, at this uh, south coast of China. And uh, Hong Kong is um, one of the most densely populated cities in the world. Uh, we have uh, more than, we have approximately 7.5 million people and in this small area of uh, about uh, 1,100 square kilometer. So this is a picture of Hong Kong and Hong Kong is famous for its um, skyscrapers and high rise buildings. And so you get another view of Hong Kong, this is at night. So I went to uh, the University of Hong Kong for my undergraduate studies. This is uh, the first university established in the city. Since I was uh, very young, I became aware that I love uh, to think and get to the bottom of things. And so when I first learned physics in high school, I immediately fell in love with the subject and I know that I have to um, study this uh, physics at the university. Uh, although I, uh, at that time, uh, I was not too encouraged uh, for that because People think that studying science, pure science, uh, will not give, lead to a good profession. I was actually asked to consider medicine or engineering uh, because of my very good uh, exam results. I may not be able to get in whatever subject I would like to study. But I keep to my love and I study uh, both math and physics. So near the end of my uh, undergraduate studies, I realized that I still have the capacity to learn more. And so this idea of uh, going abroad for my graduate studies uh, appeared. But at that time, it was just purely a love for learning. I have no concrete idea of, of pursuing a career in, in, in physics or even becoming a professor. Uh, so I started to prepare for my um, applications, but I didn't know much about the universities in the, the abroad. So I went to uh, seek advice from my um, high school physics teacher, uh, asking about you know, which universities would be good to apply. Well, it turns out that he was not supportive of my idea of pursuing graduate studies. He thought that um, just to pursue a PhD studies out of, uh, purely out of the love of learning is uh, a risky move. And he would say that you, know, you don't really know whether you enjoy uh, the work and you, whether this love will sustain. So because of that, I settled for studying um, a master degree. I went, I, I think that it would be good to try out research first, uh, doing a entry degree. So there was uh, there were uh, two universities uh, in Hong Kong at that time. So I thought it would be good to change environment, and so I went to the Chinese University of Hong Kong and pursued my uh, entry degree. And I since I love to, to think, I, I immediately know that theory is the, what I want to do. And there I was uh, supervised by two uh, supervisors, Professor. Kenneth Young and Ho Ming Lai, that was myself. And, and I was doing theoretical calculations on some dielectric nature spheres as uh, leaky cavities. And then I'm able to uh, publish uh, two papers at the time. So this experience of doing research uh, is, uh, uh, you know, it is become very clear to me that research is the thing that I would like to do and becoming a professor is what I want to do to be for my career. So I then started to, uh, I, I, I applied for uh, several universities in the States and I got accepted by a few. And eventually I decided to go to uh, University of Chicago. But when I told my parents my decision to study abroad, uh, they were not all supportive. My parents didn't have much education themselves and also they have this traditional Chinese thinking that uh, it is not good for women to be too educated. So my mother and my grandmother talked to me, tried to talk me out of this decision. And I also received not very encouraging comments from my two professors. 
and not my supervisors, but other professors. One of them will just uh, state directly in front of me that the society, what well, is in his words, the society does not need female theoretical physicists. And another one will uh, comment that I was too old because I already spent two more years for my MPhil studies. He said he, uh, I was too old to compete with those young students uh, directly graduated from this special class for gifted young at uh, some universities in China. Well, nonetheless, I didn't change my mind. So I uh, went to Chicago and I was fortunate to uh, have Professor Leo Kenio as my uh, supervisor. And he introduced me to this problem of uh, fluid turbulence. And I was able to publish my first single authored physical letters there. And so that was very fulfilling. And after my uh, PhD studies, I went to um, ITP, then ITP, now KITP of UC Santa Barbara. Uh, and I'm also fortunate to work with Jim Langer there on a dynamic, dynamic fracture. And after my postdoc, I returned back to Hong Kong, picking up a faculty position at the Department of uh, Physics in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And that's a view of our campus. We have the largest campus on, in Hong Kong. And I was the first uh, woman faculty in the department. And I have been fortunate to have many good mentors uh, besides Leo and uh, Jim, and I also have benefited on many discussions with Albert Lipschebeck, then at Chicago. My first problem uh, on fluid turbulence in Chicago was actually to uh, analyze the temperature measurements taken by his group in uh, turbulent uh, radiative Gnarl convection. So when I, I con have continued to work on fluid turbulence up to today and um, on different aspects, different problems, and I also have uh, learned a lot from my uh, collaborators and among them, I have two long-time collaborators, Ituma Fukatra and from uh, Israel and Roberta Bensi from Italy, working especially on uh, turbine jet reduction by polymers and the effect of polymers on turbine heat transport. And currently, I also work on, uh, I try to develop boundary layer theories for uh, thermally driven turbulence, uh, working together with Olga Chiskina from uh, Max Planck Institute in uh, Gottingen. So besides working on fluid turbulence, I also always uh, remember the opportunities uh, to work uh, from uh, biology. And I also work on problems that are closer to biology. I would not say very into biology yet, but closer to biology. So um, I, we have analyzed the human heart rate variability, and we are able to come up with features that allow us to distinguish between uh, healthy subjects and uh, subjects that have a congestive heart failure. And since I like to think so much, I'm always fascinated by the brain and how our brain works. And I think that uh, knowing how the, the, the varying uh, pattern of the nuance in our brain would help, uh, may be able to provide some clues. But it is not easy to um, measure the connectivity of nuance directly. So I started out, uh, we started out to um, develop methods to reconstruct the networks from dynamics. And recently we have applied our method to uh, extract connectivity of uh, cortical neuronal cultures from voltage measurements taken um, by multilateral array. And we are now trying to uh, use some numerical model and implementing this uh, connectivity to study the relationships between structure and dynamics and possibly structure and uh, function later. So after, oops, sorry, after all these years, the most important thing that I've learned is to follow your heart and don't let others define or confine what you can do. So that's the thing I would like to share with you. And finally, I would like to end my presentation by sharing uh, a slide that I stole from Leo's talk, one of Leo's talk, about finding the right problem. So that is exactly a copy from his talk. So what is an interesting problem? One that helps us form powerful ideas. So how can find, one find a problem like that? And his advice is to find something beautiful in general that nobody understands. And then how do you do that? That's an interesting problem. <laughs> so that's the style of Leo. And I'll add to 
that that you know it's important to find something that is interest you, and so no matter what outcome, at least the journey of solving the problem is, uh, you know, is uh, interesting to yourself and so is rewarding at, at least for that. So with that, I will end my presentation and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Emily, for that fantastic and inspiring talk. While I wait for others to put their questions in the chat, let me start by asking you, uh, mm -hmm. in, in light of the last slide and what you just said about it's the journey that matters, I wonder about the number of different no's and discouraging things you were told early on in your life as you set out to become a caregiver physicist. And I wonder how you imagine these journeys would be different if you had instead heard, yes, go for it. Uh, that's awesome at these very crucial moments. Uh... Not so if you had sure. heard, sorry, if you had yeah. heard encouraging words rather than discouraging words in your early years, or if people like us hear encouraging rather than discouraging words, how impactful do you think that would be instead? Thank you. I think, uh, well, first, of course, uh, it's always uh, nicer to hear encouraging remarks than discouraging remarks. Uh, but I think, um, and you, that makes it uh, more difficult in the sense that I always think I have to prove myself. Uh, and then this is actually sometimes it's tiring. But on the other hand, for some reason, I never listen <laughs> much to people, although I seek for advice. But somehow, even my parents, when they say they, they said, uh, you know, it was not good to get too educated. And I analyzed what they told me, and I think it's not relevant. So, you know, it's their own experience. So I guess it's important that we, we, and we know that there are people, always people around us, around us that might not be too encouraging. And we, that's why it's important to follow our heart and stick to what we really want to do. And I think that's the, the thing. But, uh, but on the other hand, that also helped me to, to um, learn one thing as a professor myself. So always watch out not to, you know, to, to be encouraging and not to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm uh, not aware that you would, just discourage others. So that's, uh, I think that's very important. Thank you. I will wrap with a question from chat from Coyote. Uh, what emotions do you feel towards those who thought you couldn't do what you have now done so well? Well, I actually don't have any bad feelings. To, well, except for the one who say that the society doesn't need female theoretical physicists. And <laughs> Because that actually, well, as a professor himself, right, he is very um, this biased uh, attitude that is uh, uh, obviously will cause a lot of um, misfortune to others. But I don't feel bad towards them. And, and also actually, I, I know that uh, from what I do, I will be able to change what they think. And actually I heard feedbacks that people change uh, what they feel about a female, female physicist, a female scientist. I actually personally heard remarks saying that uh, one person that I work with uh, changed his mind about uh, you know before he always think that he didn't he didn't think that uh, women scientists women can contribute much in science and I was told that after working with me he made me change his mind so I guess we just have to stick to what we are interested in and people will change and we don't soon worry too much uh, what others think about ourselves but we have to know clearly what we want to do. Thank you so much on that super powerful and inspiring note. I'm closing the recording.